asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Let's get our next guest then on the show. When I say that, I must point out I interviewed him earlier today because he's based in Sydney, Australia. And obviously, owing to time differences, I couldn't get him on live. How did I come about meeting him? Well, well, I've been following him on social media, Facebook and Twitter. He's been blogging and tweeting liberally and prolifically about Syria, the situation the Syrian government finds itself in. And I wanted to talk to him about that because he's travelled to the country many times in the last few years. In fact, he was responsible for escorting journalists and activists into the country, into Damascus and elsewhere. He's a Palestinian who grew up in Jordan. These days he's based in Sydney, Australia. He's a media commentator. He spends a lot of, well, he, he does a lot of commentary for Australian television and radio. He's got some very strong opinions about the situation in Syria. He doesn't claim to be a journalist. He said to me that he could in no way claim to be objective because he supports the Syrian government of Bashar al-Assad. Now, later on in this conversation, which is kind of back to front because his astonishing claims, and he makes some very, very serious claims and allegations about activist journalists, which are astonishing, um, later on in the programme. Not individuals. Uh, I obviously would not allow anybody to come on this programme and make comments or make claims about people that they couldn't substantiate in terms of making claims about individual people. He doesn't do that. But he talks generally about activist journalism. And it is quite astonishing and remarkable what he says to me a bit later on. If this were a newspaper article, we would be starting with his astonishing claims. But I like to do things back to front. And in sequence, I'm going to play the entire conversation, only broken up by an ad break. I didn't edit it at all. I obviously first of all asked him, his name by the way is Jamal Daoud, that's Jamal Daoud, I first of all asked him to give me an appraisal of the situation that Syria finds itself in, namely who or what is responsible for Syria's troubles. This is Jamal Daoud speaking to me from Sydney earlier today. The issue of Syria is very is very complicated, and uh, I don't know if we can sum up everything uh, in in few minutes. Uh, the the uh, the Syrian officials they know that there were a lot of chronic problems in Syrian uh, government and how they manage things with, uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. But there is no question that uh, there were a lot of interference from day one in Syrian affairs by uh, major uh, international uh, and regional uh, forces, including the U.S. and its uh, its allies, and some of the regional governments. And I don't think that uh, what's happening in Syria is a civil war, because uh, according to many uh, to very uh, to many independent uh, researchers, uh, fifty percent of the fighters in Syria who were against the Syrian government are non-Syrians. And I know, I know that there are, for example, at least five hundred Australians, non-Syrians, who were fighting in Syria uh, from the beginning of the of the crisis. Uh, there are there are a lot of intervention from uh, different different uh, uh, forces for Syria because of many of many issues. Uh, Syria, let us remember that Syria was uh, maintaining a lot of independence uh, independent uh, policy from uh, uh, from the empire, from U.S. and its allies, and was uh, was a long time uh, ally of Russia, and this is. Uh, this this is a uh, main contributor of why the crisis uh, uh, dragged to so long and so vicious and bloody. And 
while Russia intervened, for example, in Syrian the, in Syrian crisis directly in 2015, other other uh, players were inter intervened at earlier uh, stages, uh, including USA, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, and other regional and international forces. Uh, what's happening in Syria is very interesting. A lot of most of the Syrian people, they know there there were a lot of trouble in Syria, and this is including a lot of a lot of officials. I met with many officials in Syria who admitted that there were a lot of mistakes, mistakes, chronic mistakes, and people were demanding changes. And we we know that uh, these demands are legitimate and uh, uh, long overdue, but without intervention from the West at the beginning and then with uh, from other players, uh, the crisis could have uh, been settled much uh, easier with, with less, uh, with less uh, uh, devastation and uh, loss, losses, including half million people who lost their lives and uh, millions of refugees uh, if they were uh, if they were, if the if the so-called uh, the so-called revolution continued uh, as ha as what happened in Egypt and Tunisia, for example, without without arms and without a lot of support from uh, many other players, including the U.S. and NATO. Now this is very interesting because the United Nations was very happy with Bashar al-Assad as far. As recently as 2008, it was happy that Syria was, was, was approaching the achievement of its millennial goals. We know that Bashar al-Assad wasn't really intent on a career in politics. He became, I suppose, the accidental president. And I'm very interested in what you're saying now because I am interested in the, in, in the genuine... Syrian opposition to the 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 Assad family domination of the country and those who wanted a kind of a transition to democracy. Now you're telling me that without the interference of the Western-backed um, militants that have caused absolute chaos in the country, that Syria would have resolved its own problems itself, its domestic problems, its domestic policy issues, and that there would have been a transition. You believe that would have happened if Syria had been left alone? Yes. Uh, look, I met with a lot of opposition figures in Syria. The, there is many kind of opposition in Syria, including the what they call it the national uh, opposition uh, figures, including the minister, Dr. Ali Haider, for example, which he, he came from uh, from an opposition party, the, and he's, he's part of the government now, uh, but he was long, he was in opposition, his party was in opposition for a long time. And in 2016 and 2015, and before even, I met with other, uh, uh, with other uh, opposition figures who told me that we have been in jail, for for example, in Syria before the before the so-called revolution, the, the current one, you know. But we are against this revolution, so-called revolution, because it's it has a lot of fingerprints of uh, a lot of uh, Western uh, interest, and uh, this is why they sided with the with the current president because they thought that. Uh, there, there are hidden agenda here of demanding freedom for Syrian people uh, uh, in this way by supporting the terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda, Jamaat al Nusra, and Jesh al Islam, and others. Right. So you're uh, saying? So, let, let, again, let me jump back. Let I, me jump I, back met in. With, I met with this opposition people until now. They, they think that the regime should be changed, but not in this way. And th th there is a lot of mistakes, and uh, but not this way, and not under such circumstances. This is very interesting. So you're saying that opposition politicians, people who would oppose the Assad government, the autocratic government, let's exactly. be honest about it. Yes. Th those people were jailed. Some of those people for for opposing yes. Assad, but they don't want to have any part of the French, U.S., Israeli, U.K. 
uh, forces that ultimately want to impose their will on the country. This is very interesting. So opposition opponents, opponents of Assad were locked up, but they would prefer Assad than a country controlled by the US, France and Israel. That's very interesting. And extremists. Because and extremists, of course. The, uh, until now, the the biggest the, uh, the biggest force uh, that is dominating the the the, 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 the armed opposition or rebellion or you call it whatever are the extremists and the, the Wahhabi the Wahhabi Takfiri and these people who are who still believe that Syria should stay secular and democrat, democratic country they know that the, the biggest threat is the. Uh, is the extreme extreme Muslim uh, groups, uh, including even the one that is uh, considered by the U.S. as moderate rebel? From from the outside looking in, you've travelled to the country many times. Let's be honest; I've never been anywhere near the country. I depend on a variety of sources to to, to form an opinion of what's happening there. I've come to like Bashar al-Assad over the years. Now, I've known about him since he became president. After all, I'm a journalist and, you know, I, I, I study and comment on and talk about geopolitics. And I felt, and I have to be honest, this is just my opinion, I felt that he was committed to, I really believe that he was committed to transition, transitioning the country, to moving away from you know, the decades-long rule of his family or any one family. I do really believe that. So it's kind of, it's disheartening for me to hear that opposition politicians were being thrown in jail because I believe that Assad was quite happy not to be president. Yeah, these people were in jail before this current president, during his father's time. Oh, during his father's time, of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, this president uh, 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 is very popular among Syrians because he he try he he opened the country and he modernized the, yeah. the, the, the society and and he allowed a lot of democratic changes uh, and he's still committed until now and I heard him personally you know I met with him in 2013 and he was. He was open until now, and he's still open until now for any suggestion of changes and working together t- with all other uh, other groups and and opposition groups, uh, civil uh, society representation uh, representative to make Syria better, but not this way, you know, not under uh, under uh, under uh, uh, armed rebellion led by extremists. I'm sorry for the misunderstanding when. I, I, I made the incorrect assumption that when you were talking about people going to jail, it was under Bashar. But of course, you were referring to his father's time. Uh, excuse me for that, um, Jamal. That's okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You know, again, I, I, I have no dog, as it were, in the fight. I'm not connected to any side of, of it. But I've reported for many years on Western interventions in we mentioned Tunisia and Egypt and uh, obviously Iraq and, and Libya. And, and I see the same patterns over and over again. Before we talk about how this is being reported on in the mainstream media and in the independent media, what are you optimistic now that it seems that these terrorist, terrorist Western-backed terrorist groups are on the retreat and Russia seems to be steadfastly standing alongside the Assad government. Are you optimistic that the Assad government um, is going to to win the day, effectively, that it's going to survive this attempted coup? I am very sure that the Syrian government under the president uh, uh, Assad will win uh, because they have they have the support of the majority of Syrians first and because they proved that they they are flexible and they are they are ready to talk about how to get out from this from this uh, from this crisis this is first second because the alternative of this government 
is a, is 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 ex, is total extremism and terrorism which will affect the whole world uh, the whole, all all developments now indicating that uh, the syrian uh, army and the syrian government with the help of russia mainly and iran is uh, they are winning and they will win but again we have other other uh, other forces that is trying to hinder uh, the end of the crisis sooner than later and they are trying still to 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 to, to claim uh, different about different things like uh, the demographic the demographic changes that is that is uh, being uh, happening in syria lately the chemical attacks and all other things and uh, without we understand, as, as a politician myself, I understand that if the U.S. and its allies will not be convinced and committed to, to start uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, real uh, peaceful process to end the crisis, the crisis could be prolonged. But the government and the state and the, 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 the regime, as you call it, will not collapse because... Uh, it, it is winning now on the ground and it will continue to win. It's, it's a strengthening its grip on power and they are gaining more on the, on the ground. And there is no indication that, uh, this, uh, that uh, it will collapse uh, anytime soon. Good. Well, I hope that's right. By the way, I don't refer to the government as a regime. It makes me sick to hear no, I, uh, Western media refer to the regime. There is no regime in Syria. There's a Syrian government. This, I'm glad to be speaking with you and typically the conversation is segueing into different directions. I just want to mention, because you mentioned Iran and its support of yes. Syria, there is a very interesting and a very worrying article in the Telegraph newspaper, that's the UK Telegraph today. You will know, Jamal, that Richard Danat is a former British Army uh, officer. Um, he was chief of the general staff of the army. He's been writing in the Telegraph today that war between Israel and Iran is inevitable, inevitable, he says, and that the UK has to choose sides. And that's a concern, I would guess, for the Assad government in Damascus, that the allies of Syria are going to be attacked, that you're going to have, you know, subplots to what's been happening and we we, un, we we know that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been warm on we've been banging the drum of war and almost begging the United States to support some sort of action against Iran. That's got to be worrying for Syria. It is uh, it is worrying, but it is not realistic, uh, and I don't think there will be a war between Iran. And Israel in Syria, they uh, they will uh, Israel will attack will continue attacking sometimes here and there, but they 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 are not in position to uh, to, to 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 start a war. Uh, the as uh, and if you know about what's happening in in the in the Middle East, uh, there were a lot of proxy wars between Israel and Iran in different areas, you yeah. know. And uh, but I don't think there will be an out all war uh, in Syria because of Israel and, and Iran conflict. Uh, the Syria now, my, my understanding is uh, that the Russian factor is far greater than the Iranian factor and it will not allow uh, for any regional uh, great uh, great war between Israel and uh, and Iran, and uh, uh, a lot of Syrians who were uh, waiting for the response, the latest response from U.S. and its allies, they they just knew that there will be no big war uh, in 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 Syria. What we what concerns Syrians Syrians more and uh, and the friends of Syria like myself is that this situation should not be dragged for longer because because the economic the financial situation of Syria is very difficult at the moment uh, after 7 years of uh, proxy wars and uh, and other uh, other uh, devast uh, other attacks on the infrastructure and, and and the economy the people 
uh, are living in miserable conditions in Syria and uh, uh, dragging the, the, the crisis longer will affect will 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 continue to affect the poor people you know and well, this uh, is the people of Syria this is interesting because i've i've read certain commentators saying that this is one of the one of the ways in which the west will try to you know to to kind of affect the resolve of the syrian people by prolonging this and making things more difficult people will eventually get fed up and will abandon their support of the government this is a concern it's not concern because they did not abandon the government uh, for a simple reason. The government is managing because of of, of uh, powerful support from Iran and Russia. And I will tell you, without without Iranian, and I hear this from the prime minister, the former prime minister of Syria, without the support from Iran and Russia, the Syrian the Syrian economy would have collapsed years ago. You know, and uh, the Iranian and and Russians are we are determined. To to continue supporting the Syrian uh, economy, which is improving with the time now, because uh, last time I went to Syria, uh, I was told by farmers, for example, that they are they are uh, flourishing because the Syrian government is regaining the control on many of the far uh, of the area or the land which is uh, which is cultivated with all these important uh, important basics like cotton and wheat and uh, uh, and olive uh, and now the even the economy of syria is is progressing more and more with the uh, gaining on the ground of the syrian army and uh, any gambling on this will be will be lost but what what's the western government wants to do why they want to prolong the 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 the, the crisis is because they want some uh, slice of the rebuilding contracts the the the, the, the rebuilding uh, bill will be mounted to around half billion half a trillion dollars you know and uh, every all these european countries and uh, and other uh, other countries are uh, uh, trying to push for some slice in this in these contracts you know now we're going to pause it there this is a recording of my conversation earlier today with jamal daoud I have not edited the interview. I've taken out a couple of my questions. In fact, I've taken out my next question, which I'll tell you about in a minute. He's a Palestinian based in Sydney, Australia, regular commentator on Australian media about Syria. He's been to Syria several times. His take there on what's happening in Syria was very interesting indeed. But what he told me next was kind of startling. When we come back, You'll hear him address something. He was listening with great interest my, to my comments on narcissism and mythomania and celebrity activists and how I felt that a lot of the so-called reporting from Syria by certain people was worthless for a number of reasons. One, because of their closeness to the Assad government and two, because of their regular appearances on Russian media. But he said to me, off air, that I've got it entirely wrong, that fame and narcissism has got nothing to do with it. He believes, not necessarily about the people I've been complaining about, but he believes in general that there is a much darker and sinister side to activist journalism, something that I hadn't considered and he makes an extraordinary claim. And you'll hear that in a minute after this break. Jamal Daoud, who I interviewed earlier today. This is Wednesday's Richie Allen Show. The conclusion of that in two minutes' time. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. 
a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others, become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www.markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Right, now to the second part of my conversation with the Palestinian journalist and commentator, political analyst, Jamal Daoud, who's based in Sydney, Australia. Before I played the rest of this, I instructed Jamal, and he was quite happy, that I wouldn't have him naming people individually or making allegations against people individually that he couldn't substantiate with absolute irrefutable evidence. Because I'm not interested in personally going after individuals. And while I have mentioned individuals in the past myself, by way of demonstrating their output or critiquing their output, I don't have any personal problems with any individual that is commenting on Syria. I never had and I never will do. He talks now about... Why he believes there is a very sinister undertone or element to activist journalism in Syria. And um, when he got in touch with me, what he was saying kind of took me by surprise. Here he is talking about journalists, independent media journalists and activists in Syria. Hold on to your hats. Jamal Dow, the second part of our conversation. Okay, the the the, the so-called activist journalists are uh, people who visit Syria uh, to report about, or to to witness themselves what's happening in Syria it has different motivations. Some of these people are good people with good intention, you know. So some of these uh, activists who were who did not have chance to go to Syria or they are they are sick of uh, the reporting of the mainstream media and they wanted to go to Syria and see what's happening and then come back and talk about this some of them are genuine but there are trend we we uh, we managed to uh, observe very closely a group of people who have a deeper agenda than just to uh, go and and uh, and see what's happening in Syria and come back and report about about what's happening in uh, the alternative media. Let us be uh, clear here: the alternative media is something which is uh, uh, loosely de- uh, de- defined. And uh, any any person who has a, a Facebook uh, account or a Twitter account will claim himself as a journalist yes. or. Uh, an alternative media uh, 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 activist, you know. Uh, but what we are trying to, to uh, what what we have, hello. I'm listening. I'm absolutely gripped. Go okay. Ahead. What 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 we have uh, with with a small group of people, uh, we we noticed how how well organized they they were and how much money they have. And uh, then we also witnessed uh, how they are susceptible to any criticism or any uh, questioning about what they are reporting. Then the biggest things what we uh, what we also uh, what also swayed us to observe them carefully is why they are attacking uh, certain uh, b- uh, certain elements of other activists who work for 
uh, bringing the truth about what's happening in Syria to the whole world. And then uh, visiting Syria regularly and talking to the authorities in Syria and witnessing myself, we come to understand that some of these, uh, so w w one group of these uh, people who claim to be journalists who have no qualification to be journalists and they can't be journalists at, uh, by any definition, they, they, they have been acting in suspicious way to that lead us to uh, major discoveries that they are most likely uh, spies for an, uh, uh, Western uh, intelligence agencies. Now this is some uh, huge. This, this, can... this is a massive bombshell, and what 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 we're not doing today, and I'm speaking to the audience now, not to Jamal. We're not naming Jamal is not naming anybody, and I don't want him to name anybody. Um, he said there. I want to just repeat it that there are lots of activist journalists and so-called independent reporters in Syria. Some of these people are genuine and their motivation is pure, whether they are misguided or whatever. They want to, to do something decent and they want to put out some information for people that is different. But Jamal is alleging that he has evidence that there are groups working in Syria and he began looking into them because of their conduct, because of their hostile attitudes towards other activists who are pro-Syrian uh, government and who want to get the truth out, um, because of their financing, he is going to tell us that he and others began investigating over the last couple of years a little bit more closely who these people are connected to. And he has concluded... And I'm not endorsing this, by the way, at all. I'm, I'm just listening to it like you are. He's concluded that some of these people may very well be actually working for Western intelligence agencies, working against Syria while seemingly being there to embrace the Syrian government and to champion the truth and the real reasons for the situation Syria is in. This is bombshell stuff, Jamal. You are and have been a journalist. You have been a political activist. You are a political commentator. Proof. Is there any hard proof or hard evidence to support any of this? Yes, of course, there is. And we handed a lot of documents to the Syrian authorities about this, which led to banning of many of these people to come to Syria again. We... Ha we have uh, uh, translated to the Syrian authorities a lot of uh, documents about some of these people trans uh, smuggling spying devices to Syria and large sums of money, tens of thousands of dollars, which was uh, smuggled in bags coming uh, with these uh, activists, journalists, or call, it, call, call them whatever you want. Uh, why a journalist who, who's going to Syria and uh, most of his money is paid by the Syrian government or if he will pay for his stay, he will be up front for the organizer of the, of the, of the tour, why they will need tens of thousands of dollars and we have eyewitness of Syrian, uh, uh, of Syrian people who, who work with us in Syria who, who witnessed, and we I am one of the guys who witnessed the smuggling and handing of spying devices, very, uh, very sophisticated telecommunication devices handed to the sleeping cells in Syria, a lot, tens of thousands of dollars smuggled in small bags to, the, to Syria and was handed to the, to the local sleeping cells. But let us ask a question here, and this is, this is, uh, this is a hardcore uh, evidence here. Some of the leaders of this group uh, sitting on the steering committee of the organization that manage their, their activities are banned from entry to Syria from 2015 when we discovered that they smuggled spying devices and money and i am receiving some some 
uh, uh, unverified accounts that they try to smuggle weapons. Right. So let but me let me let me just I, stop you. Let me just stop you there for a second, so that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. You're saying that you have hard evidence, physical evidence, and you've presented this to the Syrian government. I will ask you in a minute. Have you put it in the public domain? Because Jamal, you and I were old. Um, we've been on the merry-go-round for a long time, guys like you and I. We've been around a long time. And you know that our listeners, a lot of them will be incredibly sceptical here. And they will say, well, this is just typical now. These activists are doing good work. They're telling the truth about Syria. Maybe this is a double bluff. Maybe Jamal is, you know, trying to discredit them. That's what they're going to say. So they'll want to see, or they'll want to know where they can go to see hard evidence of this. So you're saying that some of these activists whom sometimes we see, some of them are very public, some of them are not very public in terms of their coverage, but they're coming into the country with sophisticated telecommunications devices and money to present to presumably anti-government people in Syria to no. use for spying purposes. This is amazing. If it's true, no. it's amazing. Go ahead. No. What they are doing is they are planting spying cells in Syria. They are not, maybe the most of their blunt, they planted people, their sleeping cells, they are not supporting the rebels as such, but they are trying. What? What? What's our... Uh, understanding and uh, this is we shared this with the Syrian authorities too that this so, some spying agencies western spying agencies think that it is the golden opportunity now when Syria is in such uh, in such a state of chaos now to plant sleeping cells you know and recruit and train sleeping cells in Syria, so that after the after the crisis finished or during the crisis, they will still have sensitive information transmitted to them about what's happening in Syria, to the point that some of these sleeping cells had infiltrated some of the offices of some officials. Again, you told you ask me not to name some people, but I can name a lot of. I put some names public on my on my Facebook page and and some of the blogs spots that I am I am helping with some names concrete evidence that they are banned from entering to Syria and we have I can I can provide any interested person with the eyewitness accounts myself and the people in Syria who saw who witnessed the transfer of tens of thousands of dollars, if smuggling of tens of thousands of dollars with, uh, to Syria and sensitive devices, the, uh, the uh, telecommunication devices that was that was given to the sleeping cells in Syria. Now tell and me this, Jamal, have, tell me until this. Until now, I, have, I, can, I can give a, 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 anyone who's interested and why we did not give more information because the Syrian authorities asked us to slow down until they can investigate the matter and take actions. And right, they this is interesting now. Let, let me just jump in. This, not, is, this is interesting. Let me jump in. You can tell me about the actions in a second. I just want to remind our listeners, I'm speaking with uh, Jamal Daoud. I hope I pronounced your surname properly, Jamal. Tell me it's okay. if yes. I didn't. Yes. Um, no, Jamal... Jamal is Palestinian, but he was raised in Jordan. He lived in Australia. Now, he's an activist, um, a, a, a political commentator. Um, he has worked as a journalist. And for some years, Jamal escorted journalists and activists and peace delegations. He escorted them to uh, Damascus and presumably uh, Aleppo and, and places like that for people to see what was going on in Syria. So he's been to the country many times. He's met the president. He's told me um, in a kind of a pre-interview conversation that he can't claim to be a journalist now or to be objective now because he's got a very firm po point of view about why Syria is in the situation it is today. And he talked about that candidly in the first 15, 20 minutes of uh, this uh, discussion. Now, Jamal believes, 
And I have to repeat this because you're going to have to clean your ears out because a lot of people will be stunned to hear this. But he, and I'm not endorsing it, not for a minute. I'm not saying that Jamal is lying. I'm not endorsing it. It's not, it's not for me to do that. I do not know. I've not been to Syria. I've not met any of these people. But I'm interested in what he has to say. Um, Jamal believes that Western intelligence agencies, whether they be MI6, whether they be the NSA, CIA, Mossad maybe, are running effectively activists or activist journalists who have in the past been to Syria to allegedly report in favour of the Syrian government. And he says that there is a, a, a wealth, a wealth of hard evidence to show money being transferred, uh, spying devices being given to sleeper cells. What would the sleeper cells, Jamal, what would they do with these spying devices? Who would they spy on? Okay, these people will spy on uh, the Syrian army, on the on the other uh, Syrian officials. Let us remember that uh, Syria, uh, this journalist or activist, they will. They are. They are going to some areas where there is a Syrian army and uh, some Syrian uh, 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 some some population that is uh, that is some of them against the Syrian government, others supporting. This spying devices is important to record everything happening in the in the in the country. For the other, for the spying agencies to decide what to do, we understand. Let us be very clear that we understand that the warfare at the at the moment during these times is more sophisticated, and the satellite will will have a lot of a lot of uh, an understanding what's happening in Syria. The spying devices could be to spy on officials, to, to, to record uh, something that needed to be hidden from the authorities, uh, to, to record some officials in unpleasant uh, situations and other things. We, again, I am not, I am not a specialist in spying here yeah. or in, in intelligence, but the, uh, these people are professional. Let me tell you, they, they, they are professional. They are, they are training people. We recorded some of these sleeping cells traveling uh, from Syria to Lebanon to Sudan to be trained in Sudan and come back to Lebanon and Syria. The, uh, by this, through this journalist activist, you know? Let me say this. I have to be the skeptic in the absence of the skeptic, right? And and, and yes. I am I'm skeptical of everything, and I've only just um, met um, you. But the program is open to anybody who wants to come on and talk about these things, so long as they don't go after individuals and make you know statements about individual people without at least first of all providing me with definitive proof. What about Jamal? People who will say. Jamal, this, you can't be serious, they'll say. They'll say, look, some of these activists, the, the, the mainstream media is going after them really hard. They're hammering them. Some of these activists have done really, really good work in exposing the fake so-called first responder group, the White Helmets. Some of these activists have exposed, you know, how how the jihadists were selling oil and transporting oil into Turkey. These people have done brilliant work, they will say. Why would they be doing brilliant work like that, but also being managed by intelligence agencies in the West? People will say it doesn't add up. What? How do you respond to that? This is an evidence how successful they were uh, in in their job of uh, of deceiving everybody and and uh, giving the wrong impression. Let us let us be very clear that spy always operate in secrecy, and he wants to give the wrong uh, the wrong impression. The Israeli spy, for example, Eli Cohen, he was presented himself as a Syrian patriot who was who was uh, who was full behind the Syrian government that he climbed up to the uh, position of deputy 
minister for uh, for defense and he was candidate to become the the prime minister of syria in the in the 60s then to dis to discover that he is a a, a, a a Mossad spy this is the nature of a spying you need to pretend the opposite of what's your reality if you want to spy on 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 england you need to be bro england and work for england and and help uh, english uh, government and english authorities to spy on them you can't come and say i am against the syrian government i am i i want to destroy the syrian government and become a spy uh, these people uh, they give the impression that they are bro uh, syrian government and they could infiltrate the syrian the syrian authorities to the top level which is a clear evidence that the work their work was done professionally and perfectly this is and a mad world Jamal. Jamal, let me see. jump in let me jump in this is a mad world you and i know it's a crazy world <laughs> the media we don't have journalism anymore i say this on my program every night people don't know what to think some people are going yes. to listen to this program and they're going to say richie allen is a fool He's been taken in by Jamal. Maybe Jamal works for Mossad. Maybe he's working for Mossad. This is the way it goes, right? And people will say, well, that, that's just as credible uh, a, a scenario as Jamal suggesting that the activist journalists, or, or some of them, or a minority of them, are working for Mossad or, 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 or the CIA. Some people will say, maybe this Jamal is working for Mossad. Now, you know this. This is what people are going to say. And, you know, I can't say, well, those people are just stupid because you and I have only just met. So so when somebody gets gets to you on Twitter, and they will do, and they say, ah, Jamal, this is a brilliant double agent, triple bluff. You're the one really working for the, for, 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 for the Zionists. You know you're going to get this. How do you respond to that? I already got a lot of this. Uh, yeah. and they called me today jihadist when I uh, I was attacked physically by extremists in in the heart of Sydney, uh, not lo time uh, not a long time ago. Uh, we have evidence again. We have evidence and observation. And again, we are we are, uh, uh, publicly. I am telling you publicly, and I want anyone to come and tell me that I am liar. I, I coordinate with some section of the Syrian authorities about this. We already con we are already transmitted a lot of information to them, and because of this information, there are some people, and I can name some of them if you want, that they are banned from entry to Syria because of their spying activities. These people are sitting on the steering committee of the organization that sends all these. Can I jump in there, uh, Jamal? group of, 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 of activists. Let me jump in. Let, let me jump in. Um, I, I know that some people have been banned. And I do believe it's because of information you've shared with the Syrian government. I can say that. In good conscience, I can say that. But I'd still rather, for now, that we didn't name them. And I'll tell you why. Because even though... You've presented evidence to the Syrians, and the Syrians have banned them. They would still, they would still vehemently argue, no, we're not spies. No, we're not spies. So, in fairness to them, you know, I, I, I will continue to give right of reply to anybody who wants to come on and challenge what you've said. But I'd rather not mention them. But what I would do, and I will do, because it's proper journalism, for me to point people in the direction of the evidence that you've presented. And it's incumbent on me to do that. Again, I'm not endorsing Jamal. I'm not, I haven't brought Jamal on here because I want to attack or denigrate or um, take down anybody in particular. Not at all. It's not in my interest to do that. I couldn't, it couldn't be further from my motivation here. But I will um, endeavour to point my audience in the direction of the hard evidence that Jamal has um, has put out there. I think, Jamal, you've been around the block many times as I have. You understand where I'm coming from. I've, yes. you know, I've got to be fair to uh, to everybody and not, not allow the programme become a kind of a platform for people to use to go after people. Um, the reason I've invited you on is because I like the way you conduct yourself. I like I like the way you you know I've been watching you for a little bit and uh, 
I like the way you go about doing what it is that you're doing. And I'm very interested in the Syrian government's response uh, to these allegations. You've caught me by surprise. It's a huge bombshell uh, to me, this notion <laughs> I, I, that these people would be I will tell you, spies. I will tell you something why. For example, I am... Uh, I... I was I I can't claim, for example, that all mainstream media reporting was stupid or bad, or we could not get into the mainstream media. Uh, uh, our narrative. I myself was able to get the narrative about the the other side of the story into the into the mainstream media, Australian and non-Australians. The other side, for example, I give you an, an example, why somebody who wants to defend Syrian government, they are refusing to, to communicate properly with the mainstream media and feed them with some of the, of the narrative of the other side story. Right, right. Uh, and why, why they are making the mainstream media utter enemy when I, for example, I was, I, I was able myself to, to, to talk about Syria, about the other side of the, the crisis of, uh, about, on, on, in Syria with the CNN, with the, with the Sky News, with all Australian mainstream media. This, this, this uh, attitude of making the mainstream media an enemy is just for themselves to, uh, for, for, for them to boost their narrative and they, that they are hated from the mainstream media because they are against, uh, because they are pro Syria, because they are pro Russia, when in fact they want, they just want to direct you to the other side of the of the debate. Jamal, if this is true, it's it's sensational. We, we, we've we've just approached fifty minutes, which is where I've got to stop. I don't have any choice because. I break the program into two hours, and um, we, um, we 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 have to be finished by ten, by nine p.m. UK time. Um, I'm fascinated by what you've said. I'm very interested in it. I know our audience will be. Our audience will make their own minds up. Many of them will be very suspicious of it. They will, you know, say what I said already. Well, maybe Jamal really is the guy. Maybe and and you said you've had this before. Again, I can't. I can't editorialise here. I can't say I agree with Jamal or anybody else. I can't do that. Um, and I don't know. But what I am going to do, because it's, it's only right and proper, is there some place you would direct our audience to go and look, whether it's a website? I mean, I will obviously give your Twitter details. Where can they go and view some of the evidence that you've uh, put in the public domain? They can contact me on my Facebook page, and we have different, uh, different platforms uh, that we are working together with uh, to expose this. The, what's happening here? There is a good blog spot. Uh, it's called. Uh, uh, I can't remember the blog spot that I am helping with. It's a uh, uh, agenda exposed. Uh, and we are very, we, a lot of information were put there about some evidence, some concrete evidence, some names, some dates, and a lot of documents. And I, I, I can uh, send you the, 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 the link, the, the, the link to the, to the website, to the, to the blog spot, and I would welcome anyone to contact me on on, on my Facebook page or the Twitter and uh, and will direct them to the different uh, resources that we are working on. And I will put, because this is recorded, at the end of this recording, at the end of this, when it broadcasts on the live show, I will give the links to the blog and I will obviously put links out there to your Twitter handle as well. And people then can look at what you've put in the public domain and they can make their own mind up. I certainly won't be trying to influence anybody either way. I suppose this is the essence of the alternative media. You put stuff out there and let people have a look at it and let people weigh it up and make their own decision. Thanks for coming on. Let's speak again as things develop in Syria. 
Let's talk about... Many times, Richie. Yeah, we'll talk specifically in the future about what's happening in Syria with Russia, with Iran, Hezbollah, Israel. Um, I'd like to have you on to talk about those things. I don't have, you know, access to too many people who has, <laughs> who've travelled in the region extensively, as you have, that I can talk to, so I would appreciate that. You've dropped a massive bombshell for our listeners, Jamal. Um, I'll be really interested to see how they respond to it and how they react to it. Thanks for giving us your time today. You, I really thanks. appreciate it. Thank you very much for, for having me on your on your program. You are doing a very good journal, journalism there. Jamal Dowd, who spoke to me, li- well, it was live this morning. I can be a plonker. Uh, spoke to me from Sydney earlier today because of the time difference there. Palestinian man based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I'm going to just mention again, the Facebook page is entitled Fake Experts on Syria Exposed. I've tweeted this out. And the blog that he couldn't remember the name, the blog is exposedhiddenagendas.blogspot.com.au exposedhiddenagendas.blogspot.com.au It's funny how people jump to conclusions about who's being accused of what. The two people that have been banned from entering Syria again, that the names that Jamal shared with me earlier on, are probably not known to you. Uh, they weren't known to me earlier on. I wouldn't be jumping to any conclusions about who he might be accusing and who he might not be accusing. Let me state categorically, I neither believe nor disbelieve Jamal because I don't know him that well. And I asked the appropriate questions. His critics claim that he is lying, that he himself is a double agent who works to destroy the reputations of people who have gone to report in Syria. That's what they would say. It's very important to point that out. So um, it's really up to you. You've got the um, interview and you've got the links to the information. Some of it is in Arabic, some of it is in English. That was... Jamal Daoud, and I was very interested in hearing what he had to say.